So what is a transaction? Well, it's a set of operations that have to behave as a single operation. So the simplest example is the bank account. If you, in this, if you do something like a uh, deposit, um, you read the account balance, you, you add a number to it, which is whatever the, the deposit amount is, and then you write that back out. Why does that all have to act as one operation? If it, if it, if it, it seems to be three operations, then you can get into a situation where you have, say, so this is read, add, and then write. Suppose that two of these are going on at the same time. Add and then write. And suppose that your starting balance says 100 bucks. And suppose these are two deposits that are going into your account. One is going to be your um, year-end bonus, which is, say, uh, 30K. And uh, this one is uh, a, a check you got in, like some rebate check you got in the mail for 10 bucks. Now, suppose that both of these started reading this amount before any write was done. So this one says, oh, you know, the, the balance, current balance is 100. It adds, and it, at this step, it thinks that the new balance should be 110. And over here, we're at 30,000. 100, and you can see where this is going. Um, now, the, 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 whichever one of these does the right first is going gonna, is gonna, <laughs> is gonna to cause a huge potential heart attack, right, if it's, if it's um, this one that does it first. If this guy writes first in the timeline, and then this one writes, you've just lost 30K. Okay, so what a transaction is, is you need to make these operations, a set of operations like this, you have to have a way of, of being able to specify that a set of operations should happen as one. So there's, in that case, there's, there's going to be an ordering between when these happen. And it's okay, in this case, it's okay, it doesn't matter which one happens first or second as long as they happen all as one. So that's what we're going to talk about is how you think about that, how you do that, and what some of the issues are. So some of the objectives you want when you're, when you're thinking about transactions are you want consistency. That's one of your key objectives. That's why you want these to operate as one. You want fault tolerance. If something happens to one of these you know, somewhere along the way here, you don't want it to mess up that, that uh, operation. And the last one is performance. As you can imagine, grouping a bunch of these, a bunch of, uh, of operations into one uh, I'm sure you can probably think of lots of different ways you can do that, but when you, but many simple ways of doing it actually incur huge performance overheads. Something like Oracle, which does a lot of transactions, needs to be doing tens, hundreds of transactions per second potentially, and so you, the amount of leeway that you have actually becomes very small. Any interface that lets you, any abstraction that lets you create transactions has to support what's called or implement what's called atomicity. So what's atomicity? Well, an operation is considered atomic. If an outside observer can't determine that it's composed of a series of steps. One thing that you have to worry about when, and when you're thinking about whether something is atomic or not is that it really depends at what layer you're looking at it. So you can think of something like this scheme code here. Let's see if I can use this. The scheme code here, um, you're defining a variable to be a, a cons of Shy and Simonson. And if you think about this set car here, let's say you want to change Shy's name to Tom. Set car in this case is from the scheme level, it's an atomic operation, which means that when you do a set car, if for some reason it fails because it can't, you know, the garbage collection has issues or there's some, some, some reason that it fails, you expect that this, uh, this uh, pair here is still going to be either shy or it's going to be Tom. When you think about it underneath, though, at the layers underneath uh, the, the operating system level where you have machine instructions and, and processes, you can imagine that this doing this set car can involve lots of operations, fetching memory, allocating a, 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 a symbol here. And one of these operations fails, 
you don't ever want the, um, actually this should be car, you don't ever want the car to be something like um, T-H-A-I. Like suppose that it started, it started changing it to T and then something broke and then you get T-H-A-I. You wouldn't expect that behavior. You'd expect this operation to be atomic. Either the, the car is going to be shy or it's going to be Tom, but you don't expect some amalgamation of the two. One other notion that we have to think about for transactions is one of being able to recover. So a sequence of steps, recoverability, to be able to recover is, means that if you do a sequence of steps, that once you initiate them, they either complete or, they, or that the whole thing backs out. And what do you mean by back out? Back out means that the effects of any of those steps are not observable. So if you had some big transaction going on here, uh, it was adding this number to that number and changing the, changing the balance and so on. If something, ha something broke along the way, you want it to either, if it didn't finish, you want it to be able to back out and, re and any updates or any changes that it did, you want those to be rolled back to, some, to the state that they were in before this transaction happened. So this notion of recoverability is something that you're going to have to build into to the transaction mechanism. It's an, so to make these transactions basically be all or nothing. So it's very much related to that. Right? It's very it's very much related to it, but it's very much yes, it is very much related. But you can have something that's recoverable that's not necessarily atomic. That's why I bring in this this notion of of recoverability. So something like. I mean, think about, here's a couple examples. A recoverable action, just something every day. If you go and charge your credit card and buy an appliance somewhere at Walmart, you can go back and, and return it. Um, and in fact, do you guys ever, do you guys have a leech mirror anywhere near your, your leech mirror? There used to be a leech mirror over here at, um, uh, at the uh, mall. And what, they had this policy that they would return, you know, they would take anything as a return. And this was actually quite abused by, uh, by many uh, MIT students who would take home these honkin' stereos for 30 days and then just return them. And the reason they, they could do that is because that, that charge on their credit card was a recoverable action, unlike some other types of actions. So something like, you know, this, these are kind of Humpty Dumpty type actions. You know, if you break an egg, that's an unrecoverable action. If you burn a document, same thing there. Uh, and an interesting one is when you dispense cash, like imagine that there is uh, the ATMs, you know, clicks and opens up the thing to put the cash out. You know, once you do that, if you close it back again real quick, that doesn't, that's no guarantee that that cash is all going to be there. Um, someone could have swiped it. And so, you, so this is a, an instance of, a, of an unrecoverable action. If you try to put that type of action inside some kind of transaction like this, it's something that's going to be very hard to roll back, because, especially if someone else has the money. So let's think about um, something that where, where you can have uh, where you can have atomic uh, recoverable um, file uh, uh, file system. And here's an example, which is file logging. Um, there's this type of technique has been around for quite a while, and so I just this is a generic version of it. And here, what we want to do is Imagine that our goal was to write, to make disk writes, be, appear to be atomic with respect to system failures. So what you want is that any time you say write, what, it, what happens is either you get back something that says, yes, it's been written, and from then on you can assume that even if the server crashes and something bad happens to it, that, that file, those write will be there, or that you get back something saying it didn't complete. But what you're never going to get is something where a partial write happens. So, for example, you might get corruption of your data. That's what you want to avoid in this case. You know, you start writing out your new DNS table, right, and then all of a sudden something dies in the middle of it. You don't want to corrupt the DNS table. So that's one reason you might want something like this. So what you do is you have a log. And this log is something that sits outside your, it could be a file, but it, in essence it sits outside your normal, your normal file system. And in this, when you get a write, you do something. You start writing to this log. So you'll do something like say, um, what's the? Uh, in this case, I'm going to assume a single server file system. What's the inode of this file? Uh, maybe some kind of timestamp. 
and then you start writing the data. And at some point, when you're done writing the data, you can say something like, uh, if you need to, you can perhaps put a timestamp. But more importantly, you put something, a token like a done token at the end of that. Now what you do is, once this, once this done token, oh, and on the file itself, before you, before you write that done, done token on the file in, on the actual disk, you set a dirty bit. And what this means is, what this tells the file system is that that file here is the, the one that's stored on the disk is invalid at this point. So let's see how all this works. What you need to do is once the, um, once this token is written done, that's when you return the write. So at that point, at any point after this, if there's a disk failure, the idea is that this data here that corresponds to some file, say it's an, say it's a Ricky Martin three, that that data has to be, um, something that any future reads will see. So let's do a case example here. Suppose that, um, suppose, oh, and there's one last step, which is that once this, once this done is, uh, is completed, and at regular points uh, over time, there's going to be a, a log cleaner. And what the log cleaner does is it comes through, and it says, oh, here's um, something that I have to write out to disk. So it finds out where this, where this file is on the disk using the inode. It starts copying all this data. And then when it's done doing that somewhere over here, it'll say, you know, that particular inode over here, um, let's call it J, is written. Another way that it can do that instead of using the log is basically clearing this, this dirty bit and making it clean. So let's see how that works. Suppose that um, you're, you, the write happens and you're at this point and the machine crashes. When it comes back up again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start getting requests. Let's, let's look at a couple cases. One request is that it, it's, let's say it gets a request for this file. If it comes over here and sees a dirty bit, it's going to say, oh, this file here on this disk is invalid, which means that the real bits that are supposed to be there are in my log somewhere. So I can't return that, that data until I go through and clean up that, my log and write the, the data that actually belongs there to the disk. Okay, so that's, and once it's written there and this, and this dirty bit gets reset, then great, here's, you know, here's the file. I can now send it out. Let's say that um, a crash happens as this data is being written to this part of the disk. Well, when, the, when you come back up again, you can say this dirty bit hasn't been reset, so you basically start again and, and just go through the same operation and start copying this stuff over. Okay. Um, this here is an, somewhat of an optimization in the sense that if you crash after you finish writing the last byte and you haven't cleared the dirty bit, if you see something like this message here, you can say, well, I've already written, so I can just clear the dirty bit and not have to do this right. But I mean, in either case, that's, and that also helps you trim this log because once you see something like this, you can basically throw all this away. Yes. What's the benefit of writing this to log because we could all we could still have a crash during the write to log phase. Yeah. Which, so essentially, we're just inserting an additional write in between. But in well, that case, go ahead. In that case, the old file will still be there intact. That's right. So, but we'll lose our new data, but we won't have corrupted our old data. Well, we won't have corrupted our new data either. Thing is, once this data has been written here, that's the current copy because you return the write. And the semantics of this is, once you return from the write, this here is the, what's the new file. And so the reason that if you do crash while you're writing it here, this can get, can get corrupted. But that's okay because you have the the, the the version that you need still written up here, intact. So this is assuming that you know there's not a media failure here, which is like the disk getting blown out of the water. So if you crash while you're in the middle of writing this, yeah, this will be corrupted. But so what? You just start over here. You come back to the log and you start doing this operation again, and it'll complete at some point, uh, assuming that that you don't have a hugely unreliable system. And once it completes, then this becomes the the new data. The dirty bit gets cleared, 
and then you can keep moving forward. Yes? So it creates a separate copy? That's right. So then you couldn't have a file that was larger than half the size of your file system, or of, your, uh, of your mount, right? Um, you, yeah, I mean, it depends on, it depends on how much, I mean, if there, you, there's different ways you might be able to encode this, so if you can compress it, and, you know, there, so it depends on the inf information theory that you have around how you manage this. And in fact, there's, um, in one of the papers, uh, the System R paper, which you'll be reading, they talk about how you can do, they have some form of logging and you can use exclusive or, or you can use exclusive or to try to minimize the amount of, of, of storage that you use. But there probably, I'm sure, there's, there's gotta be some kind of information theoretical limit on that will give you the number you're, you're looking for. Okay, so now let's look at the other case. What happens if you're writing this and some, something unexpected happens? You uh, run out of disk space or there's some crash. Well, this right here then is going to either return something, that, an exception, or if you have a timeout associated with it that, that's observed by the server, it's going to time out and you're going to say, this thing wasn't written. And at that point, because you don't, this done token was never put here, and because this dirty bit was never set, then you get back to the point where the original file that was there is not going to be corrupted because you never started writing anything to it. And this becomes an all or nothing type of operation. Two parts. One is when it's writing to the buffer, in which case you still have the old copy, so that's okay. And one is when you have that new copy written, but it's interrupted as it's writing to the disk, yeah. in which case the old thing is corrupted, but it doesn't matter because you have the newest copy intact. Right. Okay. Right. So there's, I mean, this is the case-based analysis is a useful tool for doing this kind of uh, failure analysis because you, you, you can think where are, the, where are the points where a failure is actually, you know, I can differentiate between failures. And one is before this done is written. One is between this done and the time that this, that this file starts getting overwritten. And the third one is while this file is being is being uh, writ written with the d new data. And as you can see, because by using a, a our log here and, and something like a dirty bit, you can ensure that read, subsequent reads, after you've, after you ha you've uh, done a, a write that's returned successfully, subsequent reads will either block on this operation or will return this piece if it's once the log has been cleaned up and written. So now we have something, using this type of scheme, we have something that allows us to have an all or nothing write. So this is great if you're, if, for critical data like these DNS tables or something where it'd be a complete disaster if you had a partial write. And if, you know, anyone who's played with Unix long enough knows that there are plenty of times when you get these partial writes and, and you can get hosed, especially if you have some kind of write behind uh, caching. So given this example, let's start pulling together what you need to, what the interface has to be for you to do something like this here, uh, a transac uh, transaction like this. You typically have a begin and an end transaction. This is, would be in your code. And these two denote the sequence of instructions or the sequence of operations that you want to uh, transactionalize. Now, within this code, you can have an abort or a commit. And what abort means is back out of this transaction, which means restore the state. Any changes that I made, restore the state back to what it was before I started this transaction. And if you say commit, it says basically, you know, commit any changes that I've made so that they actually can be observed by someone from the outside. And that usually means you're, you're done with your transaction. So you'll see in databases, um, they use these types of things. You'll see in the system R paper that you'll read, they have actually a couple other uh, things that you can do along the way. Um, but this is, these, this, is, this is the basics. If you understand this, then the rest of it are natural extensions of this basic concept. But I just wanted to go through an example here so we can really look at, um, at a transaction and examine different, different pieces of it. So one thing that you'll notice here is this, imagine this is an ATM and you're implementing a withdraw function. And you want to make the withdraw function atomic uh, so that when you're taking money out of someone's, so you don't get this example here where, you can, where you're sucking money out of somebody's account and it can be, you can get the wrong balance. 
uh, being uh, being put into someone's account because there's one central bank and there can be multiple, you know, either ATMs or or um, ACH clearinghouse or other type of transactions going on. So the first thing that you see here that we do is we open up the account and we give it some kind of uh, account ID. Maybe this is your account number, some kind of certificate which probably authenticates you as an ATM. Probably has the PIN number in it if you didn't already verify it, and then some timeout. And what, here's an example of something that, of, of a case when you would want to abort. Suppose that you, what you're expecting back as a token, which is some kind of ID that lets you then communicate through that account. And the example here, if that ends up coming back as zero, it basically means for some reason you couldn't open that account or you couldn't access that account. So maybe someone else was, ha was accessing it. Maybe the bank was having some issues, but for whatever reason you, you can't, you can't do that. And so here you just abort. You really haven't done anything at this point. You haven't made any real changes, but this is how you abort out of this transaction. And you come back, there's probably some code that says, tell the user, you know, you couldn't access their bank. What's that? Um, so let's suppose that you actually, this account token, you actually got something valid back. Well, the next thing you want to do is read what that ba current balance is. So now you're, act you're in, in part of the transaction. Um, and what you, the next thing is to set a new, the new balance to be the old balance minus the amount, which is how much you want to withdraw. Now, in this case, we have another instance where we might want to abort, which is what if this new balance is less than zero? So someone's doing an overdraft situation. Well, close the account up so that you can, so that someone else can, can, can uh, handle it. Abort and then return some exception. So in this case, in this case, we still haven't made any changes that we would, would want to roll back and abort. Here, and there's some other operations that we're going to, I'm going to talk about being able to add in here. So here's our first update operation, which is we're going to set the balance to, uh, to the new balance, which is what, what we've uh, computed up here. We're going to close the account, and then we're going to commit that set balance. Now, one thing you can imagine is what if this set balance you know, failed for some reason? It timed out or, or some, you got some error back. At that point, you might also want to abort the transaction, in which case you would include some code like this that does an error check under this set balance. Um, and if you did that, then when you aborted, then if the set balance had actually succeeded, the semantics of this would be that the abort would roll it back to the, to the balance back to whatever value was, was, uh, it was before this transaction started. Notice here that this dispense cash is something that's outside of the transaction. Why is it outside of the transaction? Shouldn't it be in there? Huh. Well, it does, but, and, and the other thing about it is that it's an unrecoverable action. Right, so if you try to stick this, it doesn't really make any sense to put that that is part of the transaction because if you abort for some reason, you know, there's not a hand that's going to reach back out of the ATM and suck that money back. Um, it's, it, it's gone. But the possibility then that you can crash between pinning the transaction and dispensing cash. That's right. And so, and so what's one of the ways, and if you do that, this actually will, you can rectify the situation. How would you do that under this case? Because that could happen, right? I mean, some people, you know, they'll go through the whole ATM thing, and then you won't get the money, you, and then you call. But they, but, but what happens when you call? To, if, you, if it's a good bank, <laughs> they'll tell you, "Oh, yeah, we see it right here." And why have they seen it? Because this committed, and then they can go back and see that this, that this certificate, which which corresponds to an authenticated ATM, made some withdrawal on your account. So now they have, there's a recovery mechanism where they can say, okay, well, if we believe that you didn't get the money, then we'll credit your account. And how, do they, how would they know that you actually didn't get the money? What's the typical thing they do? They count the money in the machine that night. So you're, you know, you're never going to know until the next day at least, um, uh, or until the guy comes back with the amount, what, whether you're going to get credit or not. But you notice that this, that, I mean, putting this inside the commit again, putting any kind of unrecoverable action inside a transaction is, in, in essence, a violation of the semantics because 
if it, if it aborts, then that side effect is something that can't be rolled back and therefore can be seen, even though the, the transaction committed. So these are the kinds of issues that when you're writing this, I mean, look at all this hairy code. All of a sudden, there's these different things that you have to think about. Um, but unfortunately, when you're doing transactions and when you're changing state, especially when you're managing state that's in multiple places, um, you have to think about what happens when there's failure. You have to think about when you want to abort. You want to think about, we'll see later on, you can partially abort certain things. Um, but things, all of a sudden, you have, you're exposed to the, in essence, the, the side effectiveness of the real world. Why do you have to count the money? Why can't dispense cash have a check on it that shows whether cash was dispensed or not? Um, that, it could. It could have something that says, you know, try dispense cash and it returns something that says, you know, yes or no. Right. Um, but if you put that in the transaction, suppose the answer is yes, and then you want to abort the transaction, you can't recover that. No, I mean, still keep it outside. But when the person calls up and says, I didn't get my money, instead of saying, well, we'll have to wait till the end of the night. Oh, because, because that can, there can be a failure. Like maybe it's the case that they got, they had asked for 50, or for um, 10 bills and got nine. Oh. So, you know, there can be a mistake in the way that it's that the money comes out or maybe it's jammed. Maybe the last person got mad and jammed it. Um, so there can be there can be hardware failures that give you false readings. Okay. So the only way to be sure is to see how much money there's in the machine at the end of the day. Okay. That doesn't mean that doesn't prove that you didn't get it. <laughs> right. Because if it got jammed, maybe someone jammed it in a way that you know, when you come over, they, when you leave, they unjam it and pluck out your money, oh. right? I mean, there's all sorts of scams. I'm, I'm, I'm sure someone's tried something like that. Um, I mean, they have people who will come and there was a star, you know, the star market at Porter up here. Some guy um, took a little, one of these little mini forklifts and just backed up and just picked up the ATM and threw it into a truck and just took the whole thing. And uh, they broke open and then tossed it into the Charles. And uh, so, I mean, <laughs> people will go to extreme lengths to get that, to suck that money out. <laughs> so now you know, if you go to these, you'll notice that they actually try to really put these like stuck to a wall or to some like real structural support because they know that that trick, you know, that people know about that trick. <laughs> <laughs> Sneaky. Yeah, they did it in the wee hours. <laughs> That's right. Actually, I think they did use this as some kind of sledgehammer. Um, so there's a couple things that I glossed over here that are really important that are implicit in, in the example before. Um, one is that you need some kind of mutual exclusion on this account. So yesterday we talked about being able to access one resource at a time uh, by one process at a time. And so the kinds of techniques we talked about yesterday for mutual exclusion are ones that you could use here. Uh, and in particular, in this case, we, don't want, we want a form of mutual exclusion that doesn't allow reads or writes. And one of the mechanisms that you can use, and there's a lot of different varieties of these things, are called locks. So if you guys, we talked a little bit about locks before. Have you guys all? Yeah, we've done. Okay, you've gone through like read locks, write locks. Have you guys talked about intentional locks? Uh, not okay. There's some, in the text you'll see this, this thing about intentional locks. Intentional locks are a way to optimize the granularity of what you're locking. So if you have something like one bank account, you might not be too concerned about the granularity because you don't, there's probably not going to be a lot of competing resources. But suppose that you want to update something that's, that's bigger, like the, whole, the bank's entire system, you know, set of bank accounts um, or, or a subset of them. Then you might have some way of, uh, then, then you might want a bit more of a granular way of, of locking only what you're going to use and still allowing other people to access um, the, that information if, if, it's, if what the transaction you're running is one that allows it. And there's examples of this in the, in the book, but I just wanted to bring this intentional locking up because it's a great technique for, um, for increasing performance. So this is the mutual exclusion is basically the, the, bottle, the, one of the huge bottlenecks in any kind of transaction system like this. You need to, if you think about Oracle, where you have these big old tables, the, you know, the guy was talking about these, you know, search tables and all. I'm sure he, what did he, what did he say how big they were? Did he talk about size? Some of these can be millions of lines long, 
right? And when you do an operation on a table that's millions of rows long, um, you don't want to lock the whole table if all you're going to do is modify one row or, or a, small, a subset of rows. Um, and this problem gets exasperated, as we'll see tomorrow, when you have a distributed type of, of resource. The other thing that um, you need here is a sense of ordering. Uh, so, for example, if you do a write, and, and the as in the previous example, let's see, um, so we do the, we, or do the set balance. If we do a set balance and commit, just like in the case over here, we may have some mechanism that where this commit is logged in some way and hasn't quite yet gotten to the to the final its final resting place. No matter what the mechanism is that you do, once you give back this commit, you need to make sure that any subsequent accesses to that resource, so for example, a, another read type balance, will see the effects of that previous commit. Yes. Why would you not put a, like a test to, to read the balance before you end the transaction? Bef like an internal check. Before you before you end the transaction. Right. Well, once you set the, um, you could do that. You could say, you mean in this code here, yeah. like say you set the balance and then after that you read the balance just to make sure it was the, that the set actually, right. yeah, you could do that. It, you may, if, if the set is, is, depends on how the set is implemented. If it's an unreliable set, you might want to read it back just to be sure. But if you have some semantics such that you say the set will, if it returns successfully, that means that it actually was set, like in this case over here. Like if the set you were doing was something like a bank account and you get the, the set returns successfully once this done is done here and then when the commit happens, you get a, you know, some kind of commit over here to make sure that gets written, then you don't necessarily have to read it. Okay, so then what you do, you put the test in the set then to make sure it gets that right. Is sort of the more usual way to do it? Or you, the, the, the test actually, or the, the, the consistency check gets done at the next layer down in that case. Yeah. And so, I mean, it depends. You could, I can imagine, you know, you, you writing, you, you implementing writes in a very different way that, that like you said, if, especially if you're, if there's unreliability and, and maybe, um, I don't know, I mean, sure there's circumstances. There's always some kind of circumstance that people would want to implement some of these differently. Um, yes? That's right. If the set balance does some kind of error checking and it fails, then you, you got to catch it. And it may be the case that you try again. Like maybe you have a loop that says try it three times, and if it doesn't, then abort. Um, or the other thing that in the ATM example that uh, some of these ATMs started doing is uh, whenever they, if they couldn't set the balance for whatever reason, they would actually write a local record to their local log. Maybe they print something out as, as, as further backup, but they'll locally log that, and they'll still give you the money. And at that point, they have a couple assurances that they're going to get their, that they're actually going to be able to get their money. One is that they've already done this read balance. And the other one is that these banks have agreements that they'll honor things like this between each other so that customers don't get upset when the, you know, they can't access their money. Now you can imagine that even up here, you can re, you can write this transaction so that even up here, and if, this would look very different if this uh, account token was zero. You might just go ahead and say, well, if I can validate the PIN then on this card, then I'm just going to go ahead and carry out this transaction as long as it's not more than 100 bucks or there, you know, there's some limit might be built. Each bank can set its own. Then what it would do is take a different branch through the code where it could write some record in some kind of way like this that's, that's, that, that's all or nothing, that writes some record that says, whenever I establish a connection back to this, to this count, then I'm going to... I'm going to finish this piece here. I'm going to finish withdrawing that amount. And then if I detect a, uh, uh, an over, uh, uh, overdraft condition, I'll alert the bank and, and you know, we'll close our books at the end of the month and figure something out. So that becomes, then this transaction in that case becomes quite a bit more complicated. If you want to practice doing transactions, um, I would suggest that this is a perfect example to use is, is something where there can be a failure mode from the link from the ATM to the server. Try writing out what the code would be and show it to your TAs or show it to me and, and go through it and ask them if, you know, this, if this is covering all the right cases and if you're using the, com the boards and the commits at the right point. 
Okay, so we talked about this. So locking. Um, when a transaction runs in general, it, there, there, can be very, there can be a variety of locks that you have to acquire. So in the bank uh, example, uh, uh, the withdrawal case, there was only one real resource, which was this balance. You weren't changing anything else. Uh, in more real-world situations, you may actually have to acquire locks on several resources. So, for example, if you're doing an update in a, in a distributed database, you may have to acquire locks on several rows or several tables across several machines. Um, and so the, one of the problems here is, like, well, how, when do you acquire locks and when do you release them? And there's a type of, of mechanism that's, that's used, um, a programming style that's used, which is called two-phase locking. And what you do there is you acquire, you, you go through, when you're writing your code, you actually include um, code that, expli that at the very beginning explicitly grabs or asks for the right types of locks for all the locks you're going to need for that transaction. And once you've got them all, then you start, then the, then you have the code for your transaction. And then when you're done, then you can release them. And actually, in this two-phase locking, um, in, in regular two-phase locking, you can start releasing the locks as soon as you don't need them. There's what's called strict two-phase locking. And in strict two-phase locking, the transaction starts will start won't start any of anything that it does until it's got all its required locks and, and in two phase locking I meant to say that you can actually start the transaction before you've got them all in strict you have to wait until you've got them all and then you run the transaction and then when you're done when, if you commit um, if you abort then you release you can release the locks but if you commit the locks are held until any updates are completed. So when you update, when you implement the command commit, um, when you implement the command commit, it waits until, for example, this type of write returns, or until there's some mechanism that's underneath that you've ensured is going to make sure that that any updates are now going to be in non-volatile storage and going to be observable by everybody else using the, that system. Now you may ask, well, why do we want to do this two-phase locking and, and this strict uh, two-phase locking? And it turns out that if you, depending on how you do your locking, you can actually, this is where you can get into a whole lot of trouble. So as I mentioned before, locking is a form of, of mutual exclusion. Mutual, mutual exclusion is a performance bottleneck. In addition to being a performance bottleneck, it's, it's a little bit more complicated because you can get into situations which are called deadlocks. So an example of a deadlock you have two processes, P1 and P2, and each of them needs to access a set of resources, R1, R2, R3, and R4. And what they, what they, what they want to do is access all of them, is to grab the locks on all of them before they, they start doing any, before they start the transaction. So what can happen is that, imagine P1 is able to grab locks here and here, and then P2 is able to grab locks here and here. And now P2 is waiting for a lock on R1 and R3, because R1 and R3 say, I'm busy right now. You have to wait. And then um, P1, however, is waiting for the locks on R2 and R4. When is this going to be resolved? Never, at least not the way it's. This is called deadlock. And deadlocks um, are something that you, it's, you can't actually predict when they're going to happen. And the, the reason for that is you have the halting problem. If you could solve the halting problem, then you could you go through code and say, oh, well, I, you know, I, can, I can know that this program is going to deadlock with this input. Since you can't do that, you can't, in general, tell when deadlock is going to happen. Um, so things that you want to do to prevent deadlock, well, um, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of approaches. At the very highest levels, there's some, you can actually put programming language restrictions uh, in, in, your, in your actual semantics of your language so that it tries, you, know, you can come up with fancy algebras and theories about if you use locks a certain way, then you know, you, it, you're not going to get into certain types of deadlocks, and that covers a lot of the ones you'd be interested in. So you know, that's all fine and dandy. Um, there's 
there's other things that you can do to, uh, to prevent them. You can say, um, I'm going to have an atomic acquisition of all my locks. So that means that you either get them all at once, you know, it's an all or nothing deal, all at once or not at all. Um, you can have some kind of ordering of locks. Remember the algorithm we talked about, um, about uh, with uh, coordination where we said if P1 has higher priority than P2 in this case, and we have, so in this case we're using, we're using priorities or order, that when P1 asks R2, it's going to say, oh, well, I told P2 he could have it, but since this guy has higher priority, I'll let him have it. And then over here, this, the same thing could happen over, over here, and then this guy could, could run. In that case, you need, you need to have another communication here before you, before you, as we saw before, before you can run. The problem you start getting into when you start using these kinds of prevention techniques is they typically tend, they tend to have a huge performance impact, a, a huge performance impact. I mean, in this case, you have to be running around with all these messages, and in the worst case, there's, you know, lots of messages that, that, uh, that take a lot of time. And so in terms of if you want to do, you know, X transactions per second, the, the bottleneck could very well be how much time it's going to take you to grab all these locks because all of a sudden these round trip times are, are getting in your way. And that can severely limit, that can knock you down several orders of magnitude from, you know, hundreds of transactions per second to dozens or maybe less than that. That's bad. You want to be able to have hundreds of transactions per second, um, you know, or, or someone like Oracle is going to be very unhappy, um, or, or, or Larry is going to be very unhappy. So what are some of the other approaches that people use? Suppose you're in the case where P1 and P2 are deadlocked. What you can do is, is uh, set timeouts. And you can say, oh, well, if, I'm, if we're both deadlocked, then we're going to set a counter and when we're trying to acquire locks, and if the timer, timer runs out, then we're just going to give up our locks and then try again. So what system have we talked about before that has that exact same approach to acquiring a shared resource? Ethernet. Ethernet. Perfect. Ethernet. And the Ethernet, you have the cable. You end up having to sort of pulse the line and, and, and say, you know, everybody, you know, go away. Um, now... So what's one of the, suppose that we were in the situation here and we just had the same, suppose P1 and P2 had timeouts and they had the same timeouts. What's going to happen when you, when they try again? Pretty much the same thing. If the, if the network delays here are, are similar, I mean, even if they're not, you can get into a, if there's the more of these resources there are, the more likely, the more the likelihood that P1 will grab some and P2 will grab some. And then what happens? Well, the timeout runs out and then they try again. This is what's called live lock. So you're, you don't have deadlock because they're not just sitting there doing nothing. You have processes that keep doing things. You see, you see activity in the system, but the problem is that they're not making any progress because they're not being able to acquire all the locks. So be careful about using timeouts. How does Ethernet address this issue? Exponential back off. So what they do is they, um, so they have that algorithm where they add a, each one adds a random amount of time, and the more of these, the more times they time out, the long they, they exponentially increase the amount of time. So that put, and you can read on, in the paper, and they do some analysis of, of you know how much time they expect depending on how loaded the system is. You can probably do a very similar type of analysis here with maybe it's a little bit more complex because the, there's there's more resources here. Um, so the, the main, the main uh, issue here is when you're using locks, it gets even a little bit messier uh, because you have to really think about deadlock. And you have to have some way of trying to get around it. And if your system uses any kind of mutual exclusion, any kind of locking, if you don't, have, if you don't address that issue, you're going to get nailed. So especially for the proposals that you're doing, make sure that you understand where there may be deadlock and look for t points where you have mutual exclusion, where you may need atomicity, and make sure that you have some deadlock scheme, uh, some way of, of getting around deadlocks. Finally, um, nested transactions. So here we had a very simple type of transaction, and in fact, this kind of thing works well if, you're, if you don't have a lot of instructions and you're running on one uh, processor. Uh, one of the paradigms that's used is, is what's called nested transactions. So what you have here is, is someone starts a transaction, some coordinator, and says, okay, for this transaction, I'm going to have, um, it's going to involve 
several sub-transactions. So an example of that is, uh, suppose you're doing a transfer in a bank. So in a transfer in a bank, what do you do? Well, you're withdrawing from one account and you're depositing into another account. And why do you want that to be a transaction? Otherwise, you can have money debited but not credited or vice versa. Right, exactly. So you want this to be, you want atomicity and you want, you want uh, recoverability from that, all or nothing. Uh, so it'd be great if you, seri in a normal, in the, the system we used here before, you would have a, you know, a, deb uh, a, a withdrawal and then a deposit all in one. But guess what? You know, that, if, if you extend that out to, mul to, uh, to uh, lots of different types of what in essence are nested transactions, then you're, you can get into some kind of performance bottlenecks. Um, it is, the code doesn't look as pretty. So instead, what you can try, you can use if your system supports it or if you've implemented it are nested transactions. So what the coordinator does is it sends out two different transactions out for someone else to run. So in this case, imagine that um, the data for uh, one account, I mean, it, this can be different banks. Suppose, you, you know, the coordinator says, I want to grab money from this person's account at Wells Fargo and put it into this one over at the Mumble Credit Union, right? It could send these out in parallel, and then these nested transactions can run. And what, what they do is instead of committing when they're done, if they're successful, um, you have something that's called a provisional commit. Now, why can't these nested transactions just commit when they're done? Well, because you could have managed the Wells Fargo without managing the Mumble. Yeah, because one of what if this one fails and this one succeeds, right? Then, then all of a sudden, if this one really, if this one commits the way we had talked about before, its effects become observable, and that's a violation of our of our transaction semantics, which is that anything that's inside a transaction has to appear atomic which means that any effects that are done along the way have to be unobservable. It's an all or nothing deal. So what a provisional commit is, is the, this nested transaction, suppose this one successfully completes, it'll return a provisional commit, which means that I'm ready to, uh, it's, it's, it's saying I've been able to successfully do this transaction, but I'm not gonna make the effects of that known until I fully commit. And if everybody is able to, um, and the way these nested transactions work is that if you have, so if, if one of these aborts in a way that you can't recover from it, then all of these have to abort. So provisional commit has to be something that you can abort. So if you've been suck money out of over here and you aren't, you can't suck money out of here, then you have to be able to go back here and say, I'm aborting that provisional commit. And then the whole thing aborts. Something else that you could do is, suppose that you try to suck money out of this account and this one aborts, but this provisional commit um, succeeded. If you know that, this, that there's another way to suck money out, like maybe there's some credit line that you can get from somewhere else, when one of these nested transactions comes back aborted or uncompleted, you could try a different one. I mean, maybe you'll try this one twice just to make sure, and then maybe you'll go over to the credit line and try to, try to do something there. So one of the nice things about nested transactions is now you have a way to handle recoveries even in the, even though you have some kind of, of transactional mechanism or anatomicity, uh, within each of the, of the nested transactions. So this is, this is, this is, this nested transaction, it's a little bit more complicated in the sense that you can have lots of these going on. But on the other hand, it makes it a little bit nicer when you're thinking about, about writing the code because it's almost like you're, you're forking off or spawning off some other thread somewhere that's gonna come back and tell you whether, it's, whether it was able to, to do its thing or not. Now, notice that one thing that can happen here is this one can provisionally commit, this one might fail, and then this one here could provisionally commit. So it doesn't require, this, these nested transactions don't require that everything successfully provisionally com commit you can have some of these failures along the way. So that's, whereas in, when we were looking at the bank example before, the withdraw, you know, if any part of it, if you had some abort is, you know, the way it was written, the whole thing aborted. But 
But you'd have to, in the overall transaction code, say, I need one of this kind of transaction to be completed, and one of this kind, one of every kind of transaction to be completed. Yeah, and the kinds actually can be, can be grouped. Um, because it may be that one of the kinds of transactions is withdraw money from this account here and deposit it over here. That's, that's one kind. Another kind is get an authorization from this credit card and transfer it to that somewhere where that you can actually transfer that cash under the terms of the agreement of the credit card deal. So it can be, it can be, you might actually, you know, you might have to, this thing aborting may require you to take this provisionally committed one and abort that one and try another set of trans, of, of nested transactions also. Now I've gotten one layer here, right? Let's, let's look at one of our um, complexity management techniques. You can imagine this. Also have these transactions also be nested. So here's a very interesting way. And so at the end, I mean, there may be, you know, some exponential number of, of nested transactions that actually occur. So this is, this is why you get, can get some kind of nice, um, nicer programming interfaces that you can build these up in a way that when you're at this, when you're the, ma the main coordinator, you're really thinking about a very, you're very, you're thinking about these nested transactions in a much more, um, in a much more simplified way. So like the, what, what I said before was, you know, what if this one, this one aborts and then, uh, and then, or this one aborts and then you have to abort this one even though provisionally committed. You can imagine pushing that off into a different type of nested transaction that does that at this level over here. Right, so now all of a sudden the way you think about these things becomes simple. Now one thing that isn't coming out here as much, it's starting to come out a little bit here, is that a lot of these transaction processing, they can become very complicated very quickly. So as you'll see in the, and especially the implementation of these can become very complicated very quickly. And the way, uh, for example, when you read the System R paper that talks about how you implement one of these types of transaction systems, um, down to a, a reasonably low layer. The way that you can keep it all straight in your head is by thinking about these very simple and straightforward rules. So a transaction has to be atomic, transaction has to be recoverable. When you have logging, which uh, System R does, you have to, you typically have to replicate data in order to be able, as a, this is a great technique to use to, uh, to be able to um, have some degree of confidence that that uh, when you when you uh, return back a write, that it's actually going to be an all or nothing, or when you do an operation, it's going to be an all or nothing. Um, there's something else that you'll see in the uh, in these in these types of uh, systems. Um, you can have uh, what's called a, a rollback. So if, when you're when you open an Oracle session, I'm mentioning this term because you might see it around. When you're opening an Oracle session. If you're uh, in the, doing a transaction and you've completed some steps and you type in rollback, what it does is it goes back and undoes everything that it, that's gone on in, until this, this transaction started. And so you'll see in some, in some of the literature that they'll say that they'll have this notion of rolling back. And that, so that's, that tends to be hidden in the abort, typically, because that's what an abort does. It rolls back. But at times, some uh, systems will actually give you that as something you can call directly and roll pieces back. That tends to make um, uh, you know, some amount of sense when you're doing this kind of nested transaction because you might want to roll back pieces of it. Um, but in Oracle, this is, um, if you read Philip's book, this is something that you know, has saved him and has saved anyone who's been programming this stuff a lot of times. And it all has to do with if it was part of, if you had to type in abort, that might be the same. But it, it's when you're when you're in a session, especially rollback seems like a nicer thing to use. Okay, questions. With this you know, exponential number of sub uh, transactions, all of which are sitting there with their provisional commit. Uh, so finally, you get back up and everything's ready to go. So you do your final commit. And it seems to me that. There would certainly be potential that you could start committing these things and fail somewhere halfway through. How how can you guarantee atomicity? Right. In so in that case, then you're starting to get into the, how you manage the unreliability of the network. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I mean, it comes back to the case when we were talking about coordination before. 
And it almost, this is starting to feel somewhat like a consensus type problem. Any kind of, and we'll see that a lot more tomorrow when we talk about the distributed transactions. So here I just want to get this notion in. When you start talking about distributed transactions, then you get into this generals problem, two generals problem, which is, you know, you can't guarantee that two people are going to agree to attack or retreat, which in this case would be abort or commit um, with a, with 100% certainty. But what you can do is come up with protocols that use can will end up using more uh, resources, but can reduce the probability of of you not being able to agree to some acceptable level. And in the system R paper that you'll see, I mean, this was written a while ago, but all the key concepts are there, and a lot of them are still um, actually quite in use. You'll see that they go to great lengths to identify the different failure points in their system. So whenever you're thinking about transactions, that's a key part of your analysis, is to say, well, where is the most likely failure in my system? Because every point where there's a failure, you have to figure out some way to bring the probability of that failure down to what the to a level where that you say is acceptable, a probability that you say is acceptable. And the way that when you have big issues like you know the space shuttle blowing up or huge disasters, it's um, either that was either the probability of that was within the acceptable levels, or there was some check or some point of, of failure that wasn't brought down to that point. And so when, when someone gives you some transaction system and says, like, what do you think about this? I mean, the, the key things to think about are the fault tolerance, which you talked about before. Like, where are these points of failure? And do I believe that these points of failure are all, t are all down to some acceptable level? And the second is um, consistency. Is the, are the protocols that they have for making sure that when you say, you know, something's all or nothing, do those really make sense? And then third is, given all of that, is this system, is it going to perform? Because if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't perform, I mean, there's very simple academic ways you can do a lot of this stuff. But if it doesn't perform, then, you know, what, what good is it practically? Um, I guess the advantage of nested transactions and exponential situations, though, is that, let's say, you, d you could have a 10% possibility of failure at every level. But your chances of completing a wrong transaction, if you have five layers, would be, you know, so chances of one of these not of having an error so down here. Performance problems in that you might you might kind of um, abort quite a lot, but your chances of writing a, a wrong transaction are, are you know get exponentially smaller. Yeah, I mean the way that I that I see this one way that you could that you could see that is if you think about um, imagine that that there were several of these going on, and some of the, and you were having problems with some you know communication problems or something at some of the lowest layers. These, imagine that the, at these lowest layers, like you were mentioning before, there's a different thing you could try or a different way to, that you could try. So one thing doesn't work, let's try another one. Then that means that these can all be happening in parallel as long as they're not accessing the same uh, resources. So you get performance out of that that way, and they're not going to affect, they're only going to affect the local, so the granularity is a little, is, it's much more reduced instead of if you were doing some big transaction, you might be, it might be quite complicated and it might affect the, the system in a more global way. One thing that I that I um, that you should look at in the book to make sure you understand this nested transaction is they talk about locking and there's a different there's a different locking scheme there's different locking mechanisms uh, or different locking semantics that you would use for the nested transactions. So if you to really if you to if you think you really understand this, be sure to go in and make sure you understand the locking. And if you understand those two, then you'll you'll get what this nested transactions what what this is like. Now this is going to be the focus of tomorrow because tomorrow we're talking about distributed transactions. And so as you can imagine, this is a great way to distribute the transactions. But I want to make sure that you guys all understand at this level very clearly because things get very, start getting very hairy as soon as you start distributing these out. So please do take the time to, to, to suck this information in. I just want to clarify when you talked about the sub-level or the, um, how it nests out. Uh -huh. when you, have a withdraw and then from this bank and deposit into this bank. The, the next sub level of the withdraw is this begin abort permit. That's what you mean by that. At some yeah, at some layer, at some of, at some layer, it's going to get down to this you know single process doing this begin abort commit type stuff at the simplest at the at the lowest layers at the leaves of this tree. Well, what else would it? What you, you branched off in two directions there? Right. So you get you have this provisional commit here, right. like the provisional commit. 
that when you're doing these nested transactions, this notion of provisional commit comes in. But once you're down at the lowest layer and you're not nesting anymore, then really this this provisional commit, it, it, you know, it becomes something that you, you don't use. You just use this type of semantics at the le at the at the lowest layer at the leaves. And the idea is that if you divide this transaction up right, then it's going to be very short, fast, quick transactions, nested transactions that happen at the leaves. Just boom, 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 boom. As opposed to over here, we have one thread running this big old thing, and there's very little parallelism and and very little um, uh, and and the uh, resource the locking becomes more complicated. So if you imagine the locking, the locking in, in essence starts propagating from out from out here, and it propagates through these trees. And that's one thing you'll see in, in the book. It propagates through these trees because things that are locked at the lowest layers here, in a sense, the parents will have be able to access those resources also, depending on what the child the children end up doing. If the children have read locks on them, then you know anyone along the line should be able to have, to to read that because you know this guy knows what these people are supposed to be doing and so on, but someone else over here won't necessarily be able to have a read lock. Okay.